Yeah, but, uh, but there is always. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Already, we are already recording. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, let's. It's time to start today. It's a great pleasure to have Professor George Martin as our speaker. Um, in fact, he's well known in these uh, uh, sections because he's our organized. I take opportunity to thank him for uh, keeping these uh, seminars uh, active. Um, so, uh, Professor uh, Martins is a, a friend of mine since, uh, I'll say, 2005, as far as I remember. And uh, I met him in a very nice conference. Who actually, Andrea was organizing this conference. In, uh, uh, Angra dos Reis, right? Angra dos Reis. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Professor got his uh, uh, graduate, graduation and um, PhD, I think also his master degree he got in Unicamp, in Campinas. Uh, then he went for some postdoc at the uh, United States, uh, I think first in Tallahassee. And then he moved, uh, he got a position uh, at the University of Oakland University, actually, in Michigan. Um, later on, actually, more recently, in 2016, I guess, uh, he became a professor at the Federal Fluminense. And then we we brought him to Berlandia in, I think, uh, 2019, right? 18, 18. 18. Uh, it has been, so it's been four years. Since, then, since, since uh, 2005, I had been work with him. Uh, very, it's very good interaction. It's, uh, I would say he's one of my uh, closest friend. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Professor George. Uh, the microphone is yours. Okay, Th thank you very much, uh, Edson, for this nice introduction. Uh, let me let me start here my uh, my uh, slides with the usual uh, blue and the yellow uh, colors for uh, uh, Boca Juniors. Uh, I am not a fan of Boca Juniors, but this is a good contrast. So uh, I, I should start uh, uh, praising the participants, collaborators, and uh, showing the publication that resulted from this work. Patricia Almeida, uh, who is now my uh, PhD student, uh, that was uh, the results that I'm going to show here are a chapter of her uh, uh, master's uh, dissertation. Uh, Professor Marcos Figueira and doc, uh, Dr. Marco Mania from Federal Fluminense were the people who I started on this uh, subject of uh, thermoelectric properties. We published a paper on PRB uh, for strongly correlated systems uh, thermoelectric properties of strongly correlated systems. Um, Professor Gineton Diniz, who is here with us, uh, he helped uh, Patricia with the uh, part of the calculations and uh, he was here, here advisor uh, uh, TCC. Uh, and that was the paper that uh, resulted from this work. It was uh, published a couple of weeks ago and it's already uh, available online. Uh, so, uh, I, if you are at all interested in, or if you become interested in the subject, I would uh, strongly recommend this book. It's not uh, very thick, it's something like 100 pages or, or around that, from Professor Mark uh, Lundstrom from Purdue. Uh, it's an, a very uh, nice introduction to the subject, and I would also recommend his tutorial. I am putting here the link 
the tutorial is a uh, bird's eye view of the subject that he treats on his book. So uh, it would be nice to watch if my suggestion would be to watch first the, uh, the tutorial and then the, uh, the uh, take a look at the book. So, uh, I will, uh, Jorge, can I, can I interrupt yes. you a little bit? We are, we are seeing both, both uh, screens on the presentation, the next screen too. So the next uh, you are seeing the, uh, both screens. Uh, okay. So yeah, yeah. So perhaps you want to fix that it would be better. Uh, so, so just a second. Uh, so let me see. Uh, just a second. I can do. I can fix that. Display settings. Uh, okay. Now, now, uh, now it should work. Um, here, uh, we still still seeing the both. It's still the same problem. Uh, it uh, it uh, oh. oh, um. Let me see. I, how have can to, I, I don't know how to. I have. I don't know how to fix it. Uh, that's funny because I used this computer the other time. Uh, I think you can. Perhaps you can change in, within PowerPoint. Inside, inside the presentation. Uh, let me duplicate. But, uh, Okay, it was. And uh, let me see. Uh, I am not sure. I do, I'm not sure how to do that. Okay, it's not a big deal. It's not a big yeah. deal. We can see. Okay. Uh, well. I gonna uh, let's try to go this way and then we see how it uh, how it goes. Uh, yes. Okay, so I gonna give a, a somewhat uh, lengthy uh, introduction to thermoelectric effects uh, and in, in thinking about the students because this is not really a subject that you see uh, at length in a solid state uh, solid state course. So. Uh, then I will talk about the efficiency or so-called figure of merit for, uh, for thermoelectric materials. We present our system where we, uh, for which we did the calculations and uh, show the results and uh, conclusions. So uh, the first thermoelectric property is the so-called Seebeck effect. What is, what is that supposed to be? If you, uh, if you, uh, uh, create a, a gradient of temperature in a material, you also, with that, you create a, a non-uniform distribution of the charge carriers. I will explain that a little bit later, how, how this, uh, why this happens, but uh, it's, it's intuitively clear. So uh, here is hotter, here is colder, the electrons will tend to accumulate here. This will generate an electric field in this direction, and therefore a difference of potential between the two the two ends. So uh, the, uh, the property that measures how strong can be this difference of potential is called the Seebeck uh, coefficient, which is also known as the uh, as the thermal power. Uh, how can you generate a current with this uh, effect? If you have two different materials up, the, the top one and the bottom one here, have different Seebeck uh, 
coefficients. The Seebeck coefficient here is higher than here. Then the current here uh, will be the difference of potential here will be larger than here, although they are both in the same direction. Uh, so the current here will be larger than the current here. So you're going to have a net current in this uh, generated around this uh, loop. So this way you are converting uh, heat uh, thermal energy into uh, electricity. So if you want a first introduction to this uh, subject, uh, I would recommend you, besides uh, Professor Lundström's uh, book, uh, chapters 1 and 13 of uh, Ashraf Tumerni. So uh, a little bit of history here, Abram uh, Yoffe, which uh, probably most of you have heard about, he uh, invested a lot of his uh, effort, uh, a lot of effort on research in thermoelectric materials. And here we have an example of a oil burning lamp powering a radio using the, the first commercial thermoelectric generator containing a zinc antimonide. The efficiency of this, uh, of this device was very low, was, uh, was uh, only 5%, but that was the beginning of the, of the, the whole story. Uh, well, not really. Uh, I, I can tell you a little bit uh, soon, a little bit about that soon. Uh, zinc and timonide is a, se a semiconductor intermetallic with a band gap of uh, 0.56 electron volt. I highlight here a semiconductor because, as we're going to see, metals are very bad thermoelectric materials. Their Seebeck uh, uh, coefficient is very, is very small. And the reason for that is that if you create an imbalance of charge here in a metal, this is going to be screened very quickly and delta V is going to be very low. So you don't expect that a metal will be a good thermoelectric material. So the first experiments done by, by Seebeck were done, and there is a C missing here, uh, were done in 1822. And the, the first generator that uh, was shown in a uh, world fair in Paris by M.G. Farmer, an American uh, inventor, was, uh, it was uh, presented in 1867. And we're going to talk a little, a, little bit, a little bit about the evolution of the efficiency of these, uh, of these uh, devices uh, a little bit later. Uh, one way of understanding a little bit better the effect is in a material that has charge carriers, if you have a high temperature here, you have a larger uh, average kinetic energy than you have in a region of lower temperature. So the velocities here are going to be larger than here. So there will be a net flux of charge in this direction. And that is what created that imbalance of charge that I showed two slides ago. So one way that you can uh, increase the efficiency is if you use uh, N-type and P-type uh, semiconductors to make a device. Because this way, uh, once you input heat here and you generate a thermal current, a charge current here, here you're going to have a current of electrons and here you're going to have a current of uh, um, a current of holes. So uh, therefore the current is gonna be in this direction, will be up here and will be down here while the uh, heat current is gonna go down. Uh, this way, the two currents being in the same direction, you don't have the situation that I showed in the first slide where the two currents were going one against the other. Here, the two of them are combining in the same direction. So this way you can use this to power a, uh, a load. So there is a gain, gain in efficiency in the conversion of thermal to electric uh, energy if you use what is called a PN junction. Uh, is there an inverse uh, thermoelectric effect in relation to the, the Seebeck effect? And the answer is yes, the PLTA effect is the uh, Seebeck effect to minus one. 
So what you have here is that the Seebeck effect is uh, a gradient in temperature is causing a difference in, in potential, and the Peltier effect is the opposite. A difference in potential is causing a difference in a gradient in temperature. So if you apply a difference of potential here to create a current, so you are driving the current from the outside, the charge current from the outside, you see that uh, the uh, positive charges are going to go this way, therefore the electrons here are going to uh, come this way and the holes are going to come this way, but they, they are not only bringing a uh, charge with them, they are bringing energy too. So they are removing heat from the top part of the device and bringing it to the lower part of the device. So you have a, a lower temperature here, you will have as a consequence of the of the current passing here, you're going to have a lower temperature here and a higher temperature here. So you have a heat flow caused by the current, uh, the charge current, you're going to have a heat flow in this direction. So uh, and this is the so-called uh, Peltier effect. Uh, still, uh, for one PN junction, uh, the efficiency is very low. So you can, what you can do is to uh, place many uh, PN junctions in series to increase the efficiency. And in general, what you do to increase the surface area is to do an arrangement like that. Uh, so here I'm showing an actual device that uh, it's open and you can see, I hope you can see the, uh, the uh, junctions here. So in this device here, I counted, you have around 300 PN junctions in series in a device with an area of two inches, uh, two, two inches uh, squared. So uh, let, me, let me go a little bit into the, the math of this, uh, this, this subject. The two equations that uh, you start with are these ones, where on the right side, you have the driving force, uh, force between uh, quotation marks. So uh, you have uh, an electric field that is the driving the charges, uh, which is a gradient in uh, voltage, and the uh, temperature gradient. So these two are the ones that are uh, transporting uh, transporting something are driving the transportation of something. In the top equation, what is being transported is charge, and in the lower equation, what is being uh, transported is heat, so energy and uh, matter, so charge and heat. So uh, if you if you solve for the electric field in this equation, you will obtain that, and if you plug this equation into this equation, you will be saying the second equation. This is a more uh, common uh, couple of equations than these ones here. This is the, the ones that are more used, although these ones are the ones that are, are more easily uh, derived. I will try to give you an idea of, uh, well, in doing this transformation, you see that uh, uh, kappa E, which is the uh, electronic uh, thermal coefficient, uh, is given by this expression, and the uh, 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 kappa L is the uh, is gives you what what kind what what is the amount of uh, heat that is transported by the lattice? Because this is this is important too. Uh, in reality, it's very important as we as we're gonna see. So we have uh, the electrical and the thermal conductivities, which are sigma and kappa, expressed here as the sum of kappa uh, electrons and kappa lattice. Uh, the Seebeck coefficient, which, which is S, and pi, which is the Peltier coefficient. And pi is, is simply, if you do this uh, 
this uh, transformation that uh, that I showed here, pi is simply t times s, and this is so-called Kelvin relation, and it can be proven uh, using a thermodynamical argument. So it's a universal relation. So let me show you how you can uh, use these equations to understand a little bit what are these coefficients, what they are doing. So uh, remember, this is what I showed you in the, in the first slide. So you had uh, electrons moving from here to here because of the heat here. They want to be in the cold uh, place. This creates a difference of potential. And if you are in an open circuit situation, so that's how you measure the Seebeck coefficient, if you have an open circuit, then the current is zero in this equation here. The charge current is zero. So if the charge current is zero, and then you solve for the uh, voltage, you uh, multiply by dx and you integrate and you get minus delta V, you will obtain that uh, delta V is minus S delta T. So uh, the Seebeck coefficient is what you, uh, uh, tells you how much voltage do you get with a difference in temperature. And this comes straight out from this equation here. You can do obviously the opposite. You can say, well, I don't have a, I don't have any gradient of temperature. I have just a, a difference of potential which was applied from the outside. So in this case, it's going to be the TDX that's going to be zero, and then you obtain that uh, J is equal to sigma times the electric field, and then sigma is your electrical conductivity. So if you play this game with this equation two, you get uh, you get the same uh, the same kind of uh, intuition about what are these uh, coefficients. If you create a difference in temperature but you don't allow current to flow, then J is zero in the second equation, in the equation on the right side, uh, then uh, you see that uh, uh, JQ is uh, the uh, energy current, the heat current caused by a difference of temperature and uh, the, uh, the Thermal conductivity here is just the proportionality constant between the two of them. And if you don't have a difference of, uh, of, uh, of uh, temperature, but you have a current, uh, I is, we give you the relation between the uh, ratio between, it's going to be the ratio between JQ over uh, J. So this way you get an intuition using these equations about what are these uh, coefficients. To do, to do the calculations for the system that we are interested in, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Landauer approach. The Landauer approach is the following. You, you have your device here at the center. Uh, you have a contact on the left and a contact on the right, contact one, contact two, which are very large and you assume they are in thermodynamic equilibrium. They are defined by a Fermi Dirac uh, function, a Fermi Dirac distribution. It depends on the Fermi energy and the temperature. So you have F1 on the left side, F2 on the right side. And your device has a length L. So uh, using Boltzmann transport equations, you can derive what is the current that is going to pass by this uh, device if you apply a, a difference of potential. So this expression has these two universal constants in front, the charge of the electron and Planck's constant, and three, three terms inside. One is the transmission which is a, a number, it's a quantity that depends on the energy between zero and one. So we are doing a semi-classical approximation here, so no complex numbers, this is uh, just, uh, uh, just a, a semi-classical. So the, the transmission 
is between zero and one. This is uh, basically gives me, uh, if I send an electron here at energy E, uh, or many electrons here at energy E, what fraction of these electrons are gonna, uh, are gonna cross and arrive on contact two? So this has to be between zero and one. So and uh, Me is the number of channels. The number of channels will depend on the properties of the, the device, obviously, or basically on the density of states. And this very important quantity here is the difference between the two Fermi functions in contact one and contact two. So there are two ways you can create, uh, well, obviously, if you don't have a difference in F, between F1 and F2, you are in equilibrium and then you have no current, no charge current, no uh, heat current, uh, you have nothing. So we have to create to, to take the system out of, of equilibrium. There are two ways you can do that. You can create a difference in temperature here, T1 and T2, different, or you can make the, the, the Fermi energies different by applying a, a, a potential on the, on the second contact, for example. So in this way, you get that F1 is different from F2, and then F1 minus F2 is gonna be finite. So one way of approximating is doing a, you assume that uh, the difference between F1 and F2 is small, you can approximate by a Taylor expansion and you take only the first term and the first term is given by, by this. Where I am assuming here that the uh, difference between uh, the, the imbalance here was created by ap applying a difference of, of, uh, of uh, voltage. Applying a voltage to contact two, uh, given that the contact one is grounded. So if I uh, if I replace in the uh, in the Landauer equation here this expression, I obtain this here. It's easy to see that, uh, and uh, this inside the uh, the braces here is the, just the, electro, the electrical conductance. So this is just uh, Ohm's law, because I am on the linear regime, so on and so forth. So this yeah, already gives me an expression for the, for the electrical conductance. So if I, I do a little bit of a theory here, but still uh, considering that uh, this is a very uh, large device, so I can approximate the uh, transmission by uh, the in-free path divided by the length of the device. So this number, if this device is very long, this number here is going to be small. Uh, if I, instead of calculating the current, I calculated the density of current, and I imagine that, uh, well, as I am thinking about electrons to get the real current, which is positive, I have to have a negative sign here. And uh, if I define what is called, and the engineers like this uh, concept, uh, what is called the quasi-Fermi energy, and there is a, a nice explanation of what exactly is the, the quasi-Fermi energy in uh, Lundström's uh, book. Uh, you have this expression here, which uh, uh, the Fermi energy, you say that, well, the Fermi energy is very linearly from here to here. There is no drop here and drop here. You just say that it is very linearly from here to here. And then the derivative of the Fermi energy with X is going to give you the, different, the, the difference in voltage. Okay. Uh, if you uh, then uh replace these equations here these three equations in this expression for uh the current dividing by a changing the sign and replacing these two quantities here uh you will obtain this expression here where see that i now have uh, me over a here so is the number of channels pair uh where the uh, unit of area, and uh, I have an additional E here, so we, which came from uh, here, so I have an E square here, and this is the quantum of uh, conductance. 
And this is what we call the electro, uh, electrical conductivity. So uh, this is the general strategy that we do for uh, calculating all the thermoelectric uh, coefficients. So I am just repeating the uh, uh, expression I had before, but I am defining the integrand as, as being what is called the differential conductivity. The differential conductivity is important because it's going to appear uh, in the expression for all the other three uh, uh, thermoelectric uh, coefficients. So for the Seebeck coefficient, if you recall in, from the previous slide, we have F1 minus F2, uh, but now in the Seebeck coefficient, we are driving the current to a gradient in temperature. So uh, F1, uh, uh, F1 and F2 are different because they are at different temperature. So the difference in the two of them because of a variation in temperature is given by this expression. And if you uh, play a little bit with the, the Fermi Dirac distribution, you can prove easily that uh, you can rewrite this expression this way. So it you, is basically just applying the chain rule of, uh, of uh, differentiation. So you gain an extra E minus EF here divided by T, where EF is the, is the Fermi energy along the uh, X direction. So why, why am I rewriting it this way? Because I want the, uh, uh, the differential con conductivity to show up again in my expression. So again, if, you are, if, if in the Landau ex expression, I substitute F1 minus F2 by this, but uh, I don't have this derivative in the differential conductivity. To gain this derivative here, I rewrite F1 minus F2 this way. This expression is, is, is exactly the same. And then I gain, again, the differential conductivity. This way I can write the Seebeck coefficient through this equation here which is very similar to the equation for the uh, conductivity. It's an integral of the differential conductivity as, uh, as for the conductivity, but it's weighted by this E minus EF over uh, the charge of electron and temperature. And I have to divide by the, uh, by the total conductivity. As uh, remember that, uh, the Seebeck coefficient was multiplied by sigma in that equation that I showed you. So I can do the same thing as I did for the, the same game as I did to obtain the Seebeck coefficient uh, and uh, gain again the, uh, the sigma prime and have an integral that is going to be very similar to that. But as we know, the Peltier coefficient is equal to uh, temperature times uh, the, uh, the Seebeck coefficient. This is the so-called Kelvin relation, and this uh, is a universal relation because it can be proven using thermodynamic arguments. But uh, then I would get a very, uh, uh, exactly this expression here, but uh, uh, this T would not be showing up in the expression for the Seebeck coefficient. And then uh, the electronic thermal conductivity is given by this expression. Again, it's very similar to the other three expressions above. The difference is that now uh, E minus EF is uh, raised to, uh, to a square. I have the square of E minus EF. And the reason for that is that, again, the electronic thermal conductivity, the driver here, is a difference in temperature. So I do the same thing I did here to write F1 minus F2 as the derivative of F0 is temperature. I change the expression to the, the second expression here below. I gain an E minus EF. But what is being transported here is exactly E minus EF is the difference in energy. 
energy between the level E and the Fermi energy. That's the energy that is being transferred. So I gain E minus E F to uh, E squared. I multiply by KB squared, divide by KB squared, so on and so forth, and I get this expression for uh, kappa zero. And remember that uh, kappa E, that is the one that shows added to the, to the kappa of the lattice, is uh, kappa zero minus S squared sigma T. Uh, if I wanted, I could do, uh, I could write an expression for, for kappa L, where kappa L is the uh, lattice thermal conductivity, is how, uh, is how, do the, how does the lattice uh, transport energy uh, given a, a, a difference in temperature? And uh, you can use the Landauer approach, so on and so forth. The, exactly the same idea, count the number of channels, et cetera, et cetera, do an integral, and you get an expression that is very similar to that. In our work, we didn't calculate the uh, K, uh, kappa L for the lattice, for the phonons. We used uh, what was available in the literature. So how do we measure efficiency of a thermoelectric de device? This is done through what is called the figure of merit, uh, ZT, which is given by this expression here. So we already introduced all these, uh, these coefficients. The, uh, in a way, the Peltier coefficient is here because you could say that this S square, I can take an S here and multiply T, and this would be S times sigma times pi divided by kappa E and kappa uh, plus kappa L. Uh, uh, you can find the uh, explanation of why the figure of merit is given by this expression. Well, first, this is an, a dimensional quantity. It's just a number. It has no dimensions. You can, can show this uh, easily. Uh, the second thing is that it's, it is a little bit intuitive. Uh, if you want a good thermoelectric, you cannot have uh, electronic and lattice thermoconductivity, which are the two terms here in the denominator. They cannot be too big. Because whatever uh, imbalance of charge that you generate with a difference in temperature is going to be destroyed uh, or, or better. Whatever difference in temperature that you generate is going to be destroyed very, very quickly by uh, the conduction of heat through the system. So you have to put a lot of thermal energy in the system to be able to maintain a difference in temperature. So we, that's why these two terms here are dividing. And here is a little bit less clear why, uh, why uh, it's S squared times sigma. Uh, obviously, you need to have conductivity, an insulator, it's not going to be a good thermoelectric because you, you are not going to have uh, charge carriers, so you have to have a conductor, but it cannot be a very good conductor. We're going to see in this slide here, uh, this is for uh, a, a semiconductor. So here on the left side, we have a non-degenerate semiconductor or in better, uh, in other words, the lightly doped uh, semiconductor. On um, the right side, you have a degenerate um, semiconductor, a heavily doped semiconductor. So uh, EC is the bottom of the conduction band. So a, a lightly doped so a semiconductor will have the Fermi energy down here, right, uh, close to the vertical axis on the left. Uh, a degenerate uh, semiconductor will have the Fermi energy inside the conduction band. So it's going to be above the bottom of the conduction band. And on the dashed line is the conductivity. And uh, it's uh, represented here on the right axis. And the, the, the solid line is the Seebeck coefficient. As uh, I mentioned already, a metal, 
and the heavily doped uh, semiconductor behaves as a metal, uh, has good conductivity, but a poor uh, CPEC uh, coefficient. On the other hand, a non-degenerate semi semiconductor is going to have a large CBEC coefficient, but a very low conductivity. So you are on a bind here because the product of S square sigma, which is called the power factor, it's going to have a kind of a sweet spot here, which is exactly where they cross here or around the, the region where they cross. So uh, it's uh, for a semiconductor, it's placed around the uh, bottom of the conduction bed. So that's the region where you want to be with doping or with your chemical potential, let's call the Fermi energy as the chemical potential, uh, where you have a balance of uh, the Seebeck coefficient is not too low yet, and uh, the conductivity has already uh, increased a little bit. So that's uh, where you want to, to be for the, uh, for the, uh, the figure of merit for ZT to be uh, of a, have a value where your system can be used in applications. So here is a graph from this very nice paper from uh, Mildred uh, Dresselhaus from 2013, they show the evolution of ZT and pay attention here, the maximum value here is 2.5, uh, the evolution of ZT from the early days with uh, zinc antimonide up to bismuth 2, uh, tellurium 3, where uh, some pooling devices could, be, could start to be uh, developed, that was in 1970s, and uh, a little bit before, in the 60s, you could, with PBTE, you could start doing power generation. Uh, then there was a long, once the uh, threshold the, uh, of ZT equal 1 was obtained, uh, it was almost uh, 30 years before any improvement was seen. And the improvement was uh, was when uh, is described in the title of this paper here, where I, from where I took this, uh, this figure, uh, when thermoelectrics reached the nanoscale. This uh, was a consequence of a paper by Hicks and Dresselhaus, that is the uh, Mealy Dresselhaus, Mildred uh, Dresselhaus, where they proposed that the nanostructures would be very beneficial to uh, ZT. So it was after a few, uh, less than a decade, this paper is from 1993, uh, less than a decade uh, after that, the use, the exploitation of uh, the diversity of nanostructures where you can manipulate the thermal coefficients and uh, achieve an, an optimization of ZT. ZT now is around the best values that we have nowadays are uh, where you can uh, use in devices is uh, 2.5. Uh, to give you an idea is uh, the efficiency of a, a thermal de uh, thermoelectric device with ZT equal one is equivalent to one sixth of the Carnot efficiency. So we need to be uh, way above one if we can uh, use thermoelectrics as a solution to uh, power generation. So we still have a long way to go. Uh, people say that when ZT, uh, we, when we have commercial uh, devices that can do large scale conversion of heat to electrical current, uh, we have devices, we have ZT of order of uh, or uh, we're going to be uh, in a good place. We're going to be able to uh, generate a lot of uh, electrical energy using uh, waste heat. But uh, we are still a little bit far from that. We are around 2.25 or getting close to 2.5. So, uh, 
This is interesting, this last part I told here, because, uh, well, we, a lot of people here are interested in non structures, and uh, non structures are, it, they seem to be a way for you to increase ZT, as is clearly shown by this graph here. So, uh, based on that, I decided to look into the systems here. Uh, last year, I gave a talk uh, showing the magnetic properties of this system. Uh, uh, now, I, uh, uh, I, I got interested in uh, thermoelectrics, and I decided uh, with Patricia to investigate the thermoelectric properties of this non-structure. So the base of this non-structure is an armchair graph graphene nanoribbon. This is an N equal 5 armchair graphene nanoribbon. You can see here on the right side, N uh, capital N is the number of dimers that I have in the unit cell. And uh, I can do these extensions on the top and on the bottom of the, uh, of the nanoribbon and repeat them periodically. So, and uh, we have a nomenclature for that, uh, lowercase n indicate how many, how many uh, unit cells I am modifying in my, uh, in my system uh, to form a new uh, unit cell. And then I repeat this unit cell separated by a distance given by this other uh, parameter here, the parameter m. I can place the next one at a distance of one, of two, of three, so on and so forth. And this is called the inline uh, heterostructure. And this one on the bottom, uh, panel P, is called the staggered. So there is an N, capital N here, to indicate the number of dimers of the backbone of my uh, heterostructure. And then the N and M here have the same meaning as in the top uh, panel. Uh, N equal 2 in this case, and M equal 2 uh, here too is the separation between the uh, two adjacent unit cells. So um, we did calculations for, for a series of the systems varying uh, capital N, uh, lowercase n, lowercase m, and calculated all the thermoelectric properties and the, uh, the figure of merit. So you should know that armchair graphene nanoribbons, which are the GNR here in this uh, terminology, uh, they can be metallic if they have capital N equal 3p plus 2. So for example, this n equal 5 backbone of my heterostructure here is an armchair graphene and ribbon that is metallic because for p equal one this gives me five so i know that uh, n equal five is metallic and all the other uh the other two possibilities are 3p and 3p plus one so for example um an armchair with n equal three or an armchair uh, graphene nanoribbon with n equal four, both of them are semiconducting. And the gap uh, decreases as n increases, with uh, and goes to zero every time that I pass through 3p plus two. So, uh, just to, to, to summarize here the equations that we used or that or better that Patricia used to do the calculations we calculate these uh, integrals here that are a dimensional where beta is the inverse of kbt and uh, uh, mu here is the fermi energy and this alpha takes value 0 1 and 2 and here you have what, what I showed you in the previous slides, the transmission, the number of channels, and the derivative of the, of the Fermi energy. I should point out that this derivative of the Fermi energy is a delta function. The negative of the derivative is a positive delta function that is, uh, is filtering, it's like a window when I vary mu, this is a delta function that is centered in mu. When I vary mu, I am moving this window 
through uh, the, the energy axis. And this is where I am looking for these two quantities here, the transmission and the, uh, and the number of channels. Any energy that is far away from the chemical potential, uh, this delta is going to be zero and the integrand is going to be zero. So the, uh, what this uh, differential here, this uh, window is looking, it's looking exactly around uh, the chemical potential, around the, the Fermi energy. So if, uh, if uh, alpha is equal to zero or alpha is equal to a square, all the terms here in this equation are positive. But if alpha is equal to one, which is for the, uh, the as you, you recall, for the Seebeck coefficient, then uh, this here could be positive or negative depending on if I, the energy is below or above the chemical potential. So the, the Seebeck coefficient can take positive and negative values. It's positive when the transport is through holes and it's negative when the transport is done through electrons. And the, uh, the electronic thermal uh, uh, thermoelectric uh, coefficient uh, is uh, given by this expression here. So these expressions are very convenient because uh, you get already the units here correctly because I, I alpha, as I said, has is dimension. Yes. So the units of uh, GES and, and, and kappa and KE, I changed it a little bit, the notation here from the previous slides, is already given by this uh, term here that is multiplying the expression involving the ice. So uh, before showing the results for the heterostructures, I want to show you the results for, uh, for pristine armchair nanorebles. These are the, uh, well, coming back to this slide here, this is just the, uh, the part in the uh, light blue here is what we call the backbone of the heterostructure. I build my heterostructure on top of a, uh, a graphene and ribbon, which has an, a number of uh, dimers in the unit cell given by N. And this uh, capital N, uh, lowercase n and lowercase m are the ways that I modify my uh, graphene, uh, my armchair graphene nanoribbon to obtain the heterostructure. So to, to know if the modification I did creating the heterostructure improved or not the uh, thermoelectric properties of the graphene nanoribbon, I need to know what are the properties of the graphene nanoribbon. So here we have the, uh, conduct, the conductivity for the uh, uh, for five different armchair graphene nanoribbons. These ones are semiconducting, and this one is metallic. And these two here are, are metallic. Uh, this is the, the Seebeck coefficient, left side for these three, right side for these two. And you can see immediately here on the right side on the G, G panel, uh, that the Seebeck coefficient is of the order of 0.1 or, or less than that, 0.05, is much smaller than the Seebeck coefficient on the left. Uh, why? Because as I told you, uh, metals are very bad thermoelectric materials. They have have a very low Seebeck coefficient, so their ZT is very small. So we calculated the uh, uh, KE, the uh, how how does the the electrons transport heat? That's basically what this quantity tells me. Both of them, uh, the metallic and the semiconducting, the electrons trans, uh, transport heat more or less as efficiently if it doesn't matter if they are metallic or they are semi, uh, semiconducting, they are more or less, they have more or less the same efficiency to transport heat. Uh, 
Then, in the last panels here, the important quantity, ZT, uh, where for the lattice uh, kappa, or uh, how do the phonons transport heat, we use the literature results uh, for pristine AGNRs. Uh, we went to the literature and found not for all the uh, nanoribbons we have here, I think we had for three, five, and seven, and then for nine and 11, we used the one for seven, or it was something like, like that. But uh, so the results here are only approximate. And you can see here that we have ZT of the order of six and ZT of the order of five or four, depending on the width of the, uh, of the nano ribbon. And uh, clearly ZT uh, decreases with the width of the nano ribbon because the, uh, the increase in, in kappa L. The, large, the wider is the nano ribbon, the more efficient uh, the phonons are in transmitting, uh, in transporting energy, in transporting heat. So kappa L increases, ZT decreases. Uh, and we can see here on the right side on, on panel J that uh, the uh, ZT value is very, very low. It's two, it's, uh, two orders of magnitude smaller uh, because the Seebeck coefficient of a metal is very low. So now uh, we have what we did was the following. We have results for n equal three, five, seven, and nine for this heterostructure here, the inline uh, one three, n equal one, m equal three. And uh, notice that n equal five is um, has a metallic backbone. The backbone is metallic. But when I transform it into a heterostructure, it becomes semiconducting. As you can see here in the conductance in the first panel, this is the uh, red curves, you have a semiconductor. So its Seebeck coefficient is of the order, as the same value as the Seebeck uh, coefficient, as uh, any semiconducting material. And the ZT value, is went from being uh, 2 to 10 to minus 2, it went up by more than two orders of magnitude. So that was already a gain. So, and uh, we checked that all the heterostructures that we built on top of metallic uh, backbones, metallic armchair nano ribbons, became semiconducting. So this is a gain already because we want to have semiconductors. We don't want to have metals if we are, if we want to build a good uh, thermoelectric device. Uh, uh, so we are happy with that. And we obtain a ZT value equal five here. And we are not so happy because this is an N, uh, capital N equal three material. And, uh, uh, it had a ZT equal six. So transforming it into a heterostructure made its ZT value go down. And the other two here, it more or less kept the same value it had after we transformed it into, remember that uh, we had two values there, six and four. Six was for N, capital N equal three, and uh, uh, and uh, four were the values for n equal seven and n equal nine. So here we maintain the same uh, ZT value. Uh, the, the heterostructure didn't have a big influence. So we are so-so with this result. Uh, then what we did was we, we kept n capital N equal three, we kept m equal three, and then we varied n from one, two, three, and four. And the results are these ones here, for n equal one, n equal two, n equal three, n equal four. And uh, let's go straight to the uh, ZT values here. We get a ZT value equal five here. This is a, a result that I had showed you already in the previous slide. 
we are we put it here just to compare how it changes when we uh, we change the value of n the uh, the parameter n so we go to a zt equals six here we are happy with that we go to a zt value equals seven here we are even more happy and the zt value equals six here uh, sorry so we showed already that the uh, Manipulating the parameters as we could get a ZT equals seven here, uh, you can you can improve by uh, more than ten percent uh, your ZT. Uh, you may say, well, a little bit more than ten percent is not much, but uh, if you go back to that uh, that plot I showed you of the evolution of ZT in the last uh, 70 or 80 years, uh, there, were, there was a period of uh, 30 years where ZT was stuck in one and there was no improvement at all. And then the, uh, all the excitement was generated when ZT went from one to 2.5. And uh, we need to be on, on uh, ZT equal four, as I told you, to to have something interesting. Well, it's clear that this here is a, just a calculation. Uh, it's a relatively accurate calculation uh, because tight binding des describes, I, I forgot to mention that uh, we modeled the Hamiltonian of the, of the, the system here using the, the tight binding method. Uh, but tight binding is very accurate for these materials. Um, so any increase that you get in ZT sh should be considered important. So 10%, uh, 10% is already something to be happy about. Uh, then we, we kept uh, capital N equal three, N lowercase N equal one, and then we varied M from two to, to five. So this is M equal two, M equal three, M equal five. So uh, we see here that uh, we kept the same uh, ZT as before. We get a ZT equal six. And here we get a ZT of the order of five. Here, for some reason, it's not clear to us why this happened, uh, because this is a semiconductor, as you can clearly see on the top panel for both of them. We get very, very small uh, uh, thermal power, very, very small Seebeck coefficient. And as a consequence, we have uh, ZTs here that are uh, basically zero. See that uh, in the scale here, there is a 10 to minus four on the left, on the left, uh, on the left axis. Uh, in reality, uh, I am an optimist. So in reality, I am happy with these results because what, what does that mean? This means that playing with uh, N, uh, capital N, uh, lowercase n, lowercase n, can bring large variations to ZT. So the same way that uh, we did a change here that took ZT from the values that we had for, uh, that we had for the backbone here was six for ZT. Uh, we did a change, we transformed it into a heterostructure that is not metallic. This heterostructure is not metallic, it's semiconducting, as you can see here in the top panels. But, and it, this causes a change in CT of four orders of magnitude. So, this means that uh, these parameters can change a lot the thermoelectric properties of this system. So, the same way that it, it can bring it down, it can bring it up. So that's why I say that I am happy. So we studied here the inline, the, the last three slides I showed were for the inline heterostructures. So now we do the same for the staggered heterostructures. So we start with uh, uh, keeping n, n lowercase n equal one, m equal three, and we vary n from three to nine, three, five, three, five, seven, and nine. Uh, remember that, uh, uh, well, here we have ZT equals six, so that's okay. And that was the metallic AGNR. 
Remember that N equal five, the backbone is metallic. And here we got a ZT equal eight. As I, as I told you, uh, the hetero structure, it's hard to tell what these modifications are doing. So with this one, we are extremely happy because this represents a, uh, an, an increase of uh, almost 30% in ZT. So that's, that's a large increase. Uh, for now the same thing, we keep uh, uppercase e, uh, N equal three, we keep a lowercase N equal three, and we vary N, lowercase N from one to four. And again, we have a ZT equal six, that's no improvement. And you have a small improvement here, or the ZT equals seven. Uh, and the same thing here, now we are very M. Uh, notice here, uh, I have ZT equals six, so no improvement. I have ZT equals six, no improvement, ZT equals six, and here we have a ZT equals seven, or almost seven. Uh, that is a, it's already an improvement. So I should point out, uh, maybe I should uh, go back to the slide where I showed it on the structures. Uh, I should point out that uh, we didn't do the calculation of uh, uh, kappa lattice uh, for the hetero structures. Uh, we just used the results we had for the uh, pristine armchair graphene nanoribbons. Uh, we can reasonably expect that uh, kappa L for the hetero structures is, is smaller because you have these interfaces between these different regions here and the phonons, they can scatter here. And if you have scattering mechanisms here, the ability of phonons to transport heat will decrease. Therefore, kappa L is going to decrease. So our results here for the Seebeck coefficient, they are underestimated because we expect that the uh, kappa L is gonna be smaller for the head structure. So I finish here quickly. All metallic pristine GNR investigated are transforming into semiconducting head structures, which much improve the ZT. There were slight improvements in ZT seen for some of the uh, hetero structures that we uh, studied. Uh, and there is a point that I didn't mention and I'm mentioning now, we studied only 20 hetero structures out of 1,274 in the range of variational parameters investigated. You notice that I only showed the results for, uh, for, uh, uh, for odd capital N but you, we could have done the calculations for even also. And we didn't do all the variations in N, lowercase n and lowercase n that we could. So if we did all the variations possible, we would have 1,274 1, different hetero structures. So it's very possible, as I said, that as you have, uh, as I showed you, there was a decrease of four orders of magnitude in ZT, it's very likely, it's very possible that you, one of the uh, changes in parameters there could give you a much improved uh, ZT. Uh, so some machine learning algorithm, learning algorithm uh, could be used to try to uh, see how, what, what parameters would be, how you should change the parameters to maximize ZT. And as I said, uh, we expect that uh, kappa L is smaller for the NGNR because of the scattering at the interface. Thus, our ZT values for the heterostructures were underestimated. Uh, I'm sorry, I took me a little bit more than I was hoping because we had to stop uh, to check on the uh, so that's that's it. And uh, where is that? So there is it. Okay. And here, thank you, George, for a nice talk. So um, the 
the seminar is open for questions. So if you if you have any questions, just open your microphone and or write down in, in the chat. I know I see that uh, someone sent uh Pedro, 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 go ahead. Thank you Hi, Pedro. for the, the nice talk. I have a, a few questions. Uh, yeah. what, what method do you use for the calculation of the transmission? Uh, the transmission, I hope that uh, because then she can uh, where is Patricia? Patricia, you are you are there. Yeah, I see you. I see you there. The calculations was uh, was my student Patricia. So she she used the uh, grid functions, uh, but she if uh, uh, Patricia, do you, would you like to respond? I don't know if she has a microphone. Um, I, I don't think she has a microphone, but uh, uh, she, um, I, what I can do is to send you uh, her, her dissertation. In her dissertation, there is, we didn't put this part in our paper because it was, uh, uh, it could have gone as an appendix or something like that, but all the, all the details of the calculation are in the are in her dissertation. I can send you that if you if you wish. Okay. Uh, uh, why uh, the the contribution to the the uh, head is uh, is uh, in this case is uh, is is lower for the pristine uh, pristine contribution of the the as so a why. The the uh, the final contribution for the activity the head contribute is is the because uh, see the uh, the, the backbone the the you uh, you are adding these benzenes uh, on top and on the bottom so you create uh, interfaces between regions. And this can cause the scattering of the phones. So one one way that you decrease uh, you decrease the uh, kappa L, the ability of the phones to transmit energy, is if you create a scattering of the phones. So you create uh, junctions, you create interfaces, the phones is scattered there. So this decreases kappa L. So oh, that's the uh, I am making. All the, uh, I don't know if you saw, um, if you know the uh, Chevron uh, uh, hatchery structures. They are uh, armchair. They are normal ribbons that have this shape. They make they make a V and then. Uh, and be like that, and then another V, they, they have this structure like that. Because this increases the scattering of phonons. So whatever you do to a, a nanoribbon, a pure nanoribbon, if you start it a little bit, you increase the scattering of phonons. So I am assuming that what we do to make it into a hatchery structure will increase the scattering of phonons because you are distorting it a little bit. Mainly the staggered one that is more asymmetric than the inline one. But you know, you don't calculate uh, this. We didn't, we didn't do the calculation. Yeah. Okay. We have uh, uh, had to finish the dissertation, and uh, I said, "Well, let's uh, let's just uh, publish, and uh, we can do that later." Okay. Uh, uh, the the last question is: uh, What is the the physical process that, uh, 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 but you can can uh, uh, obtain an enhancement of the CTT? I have no idea. The uh, the the referee, one of the referees asked that, 
And I, I answered honestly, I said, well, we, we have no idea. If things are very, uh, see, the expression for ZT is very complicated. It's, uh, they are, uh, of the ones that we calculated, they are, there is, uh, there is sigma S and kappa E. And uh, whatever little changes you make in the system, you are changing the three of them at the same time. That's why we plotted, uh, we plotted uh, sigma, we plotted S, and we plotted kappa E in all the figures. But it's very hard to tell what really is happening. Because see, as I said, these are, uh, I showed you the, how you do the calculation, right? Is an integral in the whole spectrum of energy, the whole uh, bandwidth. And uh, uh, you obtain a value for mu. And then you change mu a little bit and you do the integral again and you, you build these curves. So for each one of these, you have three different uh, quantities there that are changing as you are looking at the different windows, right? So it's, uh, it's not easy. Uh, it's one of the problems of this field that people have a difficulty in connecting ZT with the properties of the system. Because, as I said, as I showed, uh, if you improve uh, sigma too much, you decrease, you, you, as sigma goes in the numerator, you say, well, ZT is going to increase. But we know that if sigma is too high, uh, S is going to be too low. So there is, a, there is a sweet spot where you have to go, and it depends on, on each system. So it's very complicated to have an intuition about that. Thank you, Josh. Okay, thank you. Um, apparently there is a question. You said that for the phonon conductivity, you use the results from literature in order to compute figure method. Is it hard to do so? I mean, to calculate it? Uh, it no, it's not, it's not hard. If you find, if you find the phonon the phonon Hamiltonian for the for the system you are studying, you have to check the literature, how to build the, the Hamiltonian. But it's the Hamiltonian for phonons that uh, we uh, we do the calculation. Instead of having F1 and F2, you have let's say G1 and G2, uh, which are the Bose-Einstein uh, relations because they are they are bosons, not fermions. Uh, and the, you use you use the Landauer approach, which is uh, very similar. If you go to if you check uh, the book that I mentioned in the beginning, the Lundström book, uh, and in his uh, talk, on his uh, on his uh, talk on his uh, tutorial, I think on tutorial number six there are. It's a sequence of seven tutorials. On, tu on tutorial number six, he, he shows the expression, the Landauer expression, to calculate uh, kappa L. Uh, and obviously, kappa L doesn't depend on mu, mu doesn't depend on the Fermi energy, so it's just one number. It's, uh, it's not a curve that depends on mu. It's just a number that you will be taking. Okay, and any other question? Um, so if, if if not, I have I have some, but I I will I, I will focus on of those. So in connection with the phonon scattering, you said when you first let, let me start a, a, a little bit uh, before. So in your case, the clean of the the pristine graphene nanolabel. It's metallic, right? Uh, some of depend, them. depend on, on depend on M, right? Yeah. Well, so if it's yeah. metallic, it's not a good. It's not good. Uh, does not show good uh, thermoelectric effect. Yeah, is so when very you low. decorate, yeah, when you decorate with uh, this structure, mm -hmm. the, the edges, uh, 
you you construct like a super lattice where you have uh, now gap, right? Because you have a repetitive structure, periodic yeah. structure. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it becomes semiconductor. Yeah. So then, so so then this is, so the fix is improve improve the thermal exercise. So, but now the now the question: What is first? The question is: What is special? Uh, what what uh, graphene and oil have special as compared to any other uh, structure, an metallic structure? Especially well, for, I mean, I'm talking just because of some in, in the metallic graphene and oil. What what is special about? Yes, about the specific structure of graphene and oil. Is there any um, um, special feature that? Uh, uh, how to say had, that improves, or if you take any other structure that is metallic and then you make a heterostructure like a, oh, a, a super lattice. Uh, well, what what happens? The reason the reason why um, the reason why uh, some graphene and ribbon are metallic is the following. Uh, when when you do you can do a projection of the brillouin zone of the uh, graphene nano ribbon into the brillouin zone of the uh, of graphene. So uh, and you can show that uh, uh, as you vary the width of the well. You can show first that this the projection is a, a a sequence of parallel lines that cross the brillouin zone of uh, graphene. So if one of these parallel lines crosses the K to K prime point, you're gonna have a metallic uh, uh, nano ribbon. Mm -hmm. And as you vary the number of the uh, yeah, capital N. You are display. You are increasing the number of lines, and you are displacing them around in a in a periodic way. Three uh, uh, P, three P plus one, two two P plus two. When you go back to three P, you are in the in a similar situation. You move to the right, mm -hmm. and then to the left. You move to the right, you move to the left, and. Every so often, you cross the point K and K prime, and this happens for uh, for uh, the three uh, P three uh, P for three P. Um, so you can, I think, I have a I have a review that shows that. So when you do the uh, the decorations, and I like it, your your uh, terminology when you do the, the decorations, uh, you don't have that anymore because there is no relation anymore between the Brillouin mm -hmm. zone of the heterostructure and the graphene and the graphene uh, Brillouin zone. So uh, I am not sure why. And I and I am not completely uh, I am not completely certain that all the uh, nano ribbons that are metallic are going to become uh, semiconducting when you do the decoration because we did in study for example very very wide nano ribbons because of uh, numeric uh, machine constraints. We didn't study very wide nano ribbons, for example, where I expect that maybe a small decoration like a small value of n and m uh, won't have. Maybe you're gonna have you may open a gap, but it's gonna be very small or something like that. But at least for the ones that we studied, up to if that Patricia went up to n equals seventeen. All the metallic ones became uh, semiconducting. We didn't investigate the 
any trend in the gap, in the value of the gap, if the gap uh, mm -hmm. is slightly decreased or something like that. Well, we know that the gap decreases naturally for all of them. You have a curve like that, that uh, every so often does that because this is metallic, but it goes down, the gap goes down, metallic, goes down, metallic, so on and so forth. So this happens for the pristine ones. So we expect that this is going to happen too for the for the heterostructures. Okay, my uh, my second and, and last question is uh, in regard to phono. You didn't show the model, but do you include did include the phono degree of freedom in your calculation? No, or no, this, no. Uh, no. What we did so, was to use the uh, K, uh, kappa L. For the uh, for the pristine nanorib, that is uh -huh. in the literature, and that is a number. As I said, it's, it's a number. It's not a function. Oh, I it's, see. It's a number so because it, comes, it doesn't it come like it doesn't, a, depend, it doesn't depend on mu, unless you have some very strong electron phono interaction. Uh, it may depend on mu, but uh, in principle, it doesn't. So it's just a number. It uh, has a value for n, n equal three, n equal five, n equal seven, n equal nine. I think that is what we found in the literature, and we use this one. Okay. So that's why I was saying that uh, I assume that kappa l is going to be smaller for the heterostructure because you have more these interfaces between. If you have a region here that is like that. And all of a sudden it becomes uh, narrower. This is an interface between two different regions. So a phonon that is generated here doesn't live very well here, so it's going to scatter in the interface, I assume. Ah, so ah, I see. Kappa L is going to decrease, and as kappa L is dividing, ZT should increase. So. That's why I say that our ZT was underestimated. Ah, okay, 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 I got it. So your green function does not have uh, any information no, about the phone. Just, uh, just okay. electrons. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we we could have, it's not it's not too hard, but uh, Patricia had to get her, her PhD started. Okay. But and, then, uh, but, yeah. But then you, you, you jump into a many body problem and you have to truncate somehow with some, some sort of mean field you need to. Well, we assume we, that the electrons don't talk to the phonons anyway. That's how people do these calculations for graphene, anyways. Okay. Uh, I don't know if, uh, you, if there are effects that you want to look at the small interactions between phonons and electrons, but the calculations I saw. They consider uh, they completely decoupled. The lattice and the electrons are completely decoupled. Okay, I have one question by Rafael. Thank you, Professor George, for the talk. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask about uh, probably aren't there. Um, in these, essentially, you, you're, you're, you're making the case that the phonons get localized in their environments, and they don't, they are not uh, uh, capable of talking to the other ones. I mean, they are incoherently scattering, maybe. And, and uh, yeah, what about the case that look at uh, charge localization? Would you, would you have trouble in, if you get a big enough system? If I have charge localization, yeah, um, I I know that uh, I know that we have it's not exactly not exactly charge localization. I know that these systems. I gave a talk about these systems last year, where I was uh, looking at uh, some flat bands, really flat bands, uh, dispersion zero that show up for the systems, they show up already for, uh, for not all, but some um, uh, armchair graphene nanoribbles. 
uh, I think uh, the odd ones, not the even ones, only in the odd ones. But you have only one flat band there. And these flat bands, they are associated with some, some kind of localization of charge. And if the charge becomes localized, they don't move from one place to another. And that's the reason why these states have a dispersion that is very, uh, that is zero. It's basically zero, no, it's zero. It's uh, perfectly zero. So I, that's a good question. I, we, we didn't, uh, as the systems, when, when you go to the hatchery structures, then they have way more flat bands. They have a bunch of, of uh, flat bands. So this could be this could be relevant. So, but we we didn't uh, we didn't investigate that in detail regarding uh, the thermoelectric properties. We investigated in detail regarding the electronic properties and uh, the magnetic properties because, as you may know, uh, a flat band dispersion is unstable against uh, ferromagnetism. Yeah. So if you add a small a small U, you may get, or something larger than a critical U, you may get uh, ferromagnetism. And we, we notice that uh, ferromagnetism that has been calculated for armchair and ribbons is stronger in the set structures than it is in the armchair and ribbons. We have, we have a PRB that we published nice. uh, at the end of last year. Yeah, but if you excuse me, I have two more questions. <laughs> uh, you, you you mentioned that you use just a, you know Google type binding, and uh, it, it, do the data you know the experiments agree really well with the other uh, models that people have constructed before you? I mean, you you said that they they all all use uh, type binding, and I mean. That, other than simplicity, I mean, I suppose it, it's accurate. I don't know. Um, so there, there are no, as, as far as I know, because these head structures, they are very uh, recent. They were synthesized in oh. 2018. So there are no... Uh, experiments yet. That, that I am aware of, there are no uh, measurements of thermological properties yet. But... Uh, when in our paper uh, for the magnetic properties, we did a collaboration with a, a group here at Uberlandia that did the DFT calculations. Okay. And the DFT calculations were uh, surprisingly similar to the tight binding calculations. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the, DF, the DFT people were very impressed on how how uh, qualitatively and quantitatively the results were were were, were very similar. Uh, obviously, with uh, the, with uh, tight binding, you cannot investigate magnetic properties. But aside from that, uh, the uh, states that were being investigated as the ones responsible for the magnetism. They, they look at very similar in the uh, tight binding simulation and in the DFT calculations. So nice. that, that was encouraging for us. We said, well, so let's calculate the thermoelectric properties because uh, well, tight binding is so simple and, and uh, very, uh, you don't need a huge computer to do the calculations. Yeah. Okay. And, and the to conclude, can you uh, put slide 19 uh, at the screen once again? Uh, 19. Uh, just yes. a second. Um, let's see here, 19 was this one. Yeah, I think that's. You know, look at the happy face there. If you could go full screen, please. Uh, yeah. Um, it's a second one up here. Yeah. No, the next one, I think. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was the previous one. Oh, let me see. Uh, no, it's this one. Yeah. But... Uh, could it be the previous one? Oh. The, the previous one is this one. 
Where is it? Oh, I don't know now. Uh, let me see. Uh, 19 is this one here. Is the one with uh, the largest ZT that we found. Yeah, okay, okay. But no, it's not 19. So it's 18. Yeah, it's, I think it's really 18. 18. This one. Yeah. Oh, okay. it, it, it's very small with the very small. Okay, let me. Yeah. Let me uh, Yeah, it's it's interesting that, um, and I think that it's uh, intuitive that for uh, the top one we have the conductivity, right? Yeah, yeah, conductivity. Yeah. Near the uh, um, near the large conductivities, you 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 seem to you know that not quite near, but maybe somewhat close at the, at the steep, uh, at the ascending curve, you seem to have a large ZT, right? It, it seems to accompany that. A larger ZT. Yeah, you know, when, when, uh, f yeah, for big ZT, you have the, the conductance, uh, the derivative of the conductance is, is large too. I don't remember if I if I slept somewhere in in the in the, in the presentation. There were so many things I don't know about here. I was a little lost. But is this uh, uh, expected some, some, somehow? Or is yeah. this definition? There is something. There is something called. I didn't have time to. I even went to, uh, way above the time. I was going to add a slide, but I didn't have time. I would leave. I was going to leave it uh, for after the conclusions. If anyone will, uh, anyone asked that, uh, there is something called the MOT relation. The MOT, like MOT in the MOT insulator, uh, MOT, uh, MOT relation. The MOT relation gives you the Seebeck coefficient. As a function of the, as a true an expression, it's an approximation, uh, true an expression involving only the conductivity. So that's why, from the conductivity, using the multi relation, you can calculate the Seebeck coefficient. And then, if you have uh, this, you have the, and obviously, the kappa E2, uh, but you don't need, you can have an approximation of ZT having only the conductivity and kappa E, because then you can calculate S through uh, the conductivity and then you square it and you get the power factor and you can calculate ZT. So yes, there is a relation between the variation of sigma and ZT that is very strong because you can obtain, uh, you can obtain S as a, a in, in terms of a, it's a, if I am not mistaken, it's the derivative of sigma divided by sigma or, or better. Here I am using another notation: uh, the derivative of the conductivity divided by the conductivity. This uh, mod relation. So uh, I am almost sure that the mod relation should be mentioned in Lundstrom's book. Otherwise, you can look for it in the literature, and you're gonna find it. Okay, yeah, it's really it's really interesting because the although for m equals four and five the 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 conductivity itself it's small it's, it's not as large as the other cases but its derivative is is not small and and uh, even though the the zt is small yeah it's, uh, as I said uh, it's very it's very hard to. Uh, get intuition about this business because all these quantities, they come from those integrals and uh, you have to do that integral for each one of the values of mu that you, that you want. So each one of these curves here, I don't know what was the uh, resolution that Patricia used in the mu here for the, because the, all the, all the 
the horizontal axis here is mu for all the graphs. So yes. it's exactly what I said. If you have f1 minus f2, which is the approximated by the derivative of the Fermi Dirac function, is a delta function around mu. Yes. So this this sets a window where you are looking at when you do this integral. So yes. you are looking at pieces of the transmission and the number of channels. You multiply the two of them, and in the case of S, you have to multiply by E minus EF, and it's this E minus EF that gives you the sign. So if the transmission and the number of channels is larger for E minus EF negative, than it is for E minus VF positive, then the overall integral is going to be negative. But if the transmission and the number of channels is larger, is the other way around, then it's going to be positive. Yeah. Uh, and this is the reason why S uh, obviously is, uh, is an odd function of uh, U. Yeah, okay. That's clear from the results. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think it's time. It's time to. It's time to finish. So we have uh, more yeah. than a hundred hundred minutes sure, sure. already. Yeah, I, I am sorry okay, for taking Thank you, uh, Rafael. Uh, thank you, uh, Rafael. Question, and thank you all yeah. for. For sticking. Thank you for sending. So, uh, until now, thank you, George, once again for the nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll Thank see you next week. If you want, mm -hmm. you can you can keep discussing here. I have another meeting in uh, a few minutes. Yeah. Well, I think there are there are no more Thank questions. You,